I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about DNA testing for ADHD. Who needs it? The take-home message is that for a few hundred dollars, you can learn a whole lot about what versions of certain genes you have in your body are important or involved in dopamine, norepinephrine, other neurotransmitter systems that are involved with ADHD and other mental health conditions. You may learn a lot about which versions of different enzymes you have for breaking down certain drugs. If you have a certain copy, you wind up with higher or lower drug levels as a result. Very few right now are actually guaranteeing that they can help diagnose ADHD, but some of them still are. Many of them, though, are directly saying that they will tell you which drugs you should take and which you shouldn't take. Many of them are a little more circumspect in their actual descriptions of what they say. But I would argue that the current state of the art is that very seldom is any of this currently useful. Several companies offering DNA testing for ADHD. Again, most of these are directed at figuring out what medication might be optimal for you. And GenoMind and GeneSight seem to be the two big giants. There's several other companies. Many of those other companies actually are contracting out and have their analysis done. Insurance companies and including Medicare are increasingly covering some of these tests, whether that's a good use of our taxpayer dollars for healthcare or not is for you to decide. Many of the companies say that your out-of-pocket costs are going to be less than $400 or 95% of our people are paying zero to 399 299 but that does mean some people are paying more than that. So they are charging the government to insure more than that. Interestingly, and this is not the advertisement for 23andMe, it's only about $100. You need much more detailed information to interpret the raw data that they will provide for you. But they have, they are providing actually way more orders of magnitude, more information about different genes and gene variants. What I'm saying about ADHD is also true for depression or other mental health illnesses. Pretty much any mental health condition, we do not have any definitive tests. And the reason for that is even if we can see group differences of people with depression score higher on this biochemical marker or neuropsychiatric test than people without the condition. There's a range in both groups and there's always an overlap. So if your test result is here, that doesn't tell you whether you're in this group who have the condition or this group without the condition. So a little bit about the procedure or protocol, what happens if you decide you want one of these tests. So for 23andMe, you certainly don't need a doctor's prescription to do it. You can just do that on your own. For many of these more medicalized that are making medical claims, they do require a doctor to order the kit for you. But with the doctor's order, you take a simple saliva test. So this is not like DNA testing that was done for COVID where you're scraping the inside of your mouth. You mail it into the company. The company can analyze the DNA from those. Mostly T lymphocytes is what they generally check. So what's important to understand is that they are not doing a complete sequencing of your DNA. Sequencing could mean your entire genome, which means all of the 20 to 25,000 active genes that are identified in the human genome. Big chunk of your DNA, though, is in non-coding, so non-gene coding, so parts of the DNA that are there to modify those other parts of the active genome. So again, none of these are sequencing everything. They're looking at specific genes doing what's called genotyping it varies with each company but anywhere from about 10 to 30 genes that they think could be relevant to mental health conditions adhd depression or some of these are being done for other physical conditions as well if you're just looking at 10 to 30 genes you're looking at less than one tenth of one percent of the human genome so not very extensive what they're looking at then is we inherit two genes one from each parent Usually, for many genes, we know that a simple nucleotide substitution, so a simple variation in the DNA code of the adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine, before nucleotides together, a three nucleotide sequence codes for or identifies a specific amino acid to be inserted into a protein if you change which nucleotide, swap out an A for a C or an A for a G or an A for a T, 
you're going to code for a different amino acid. And that amino acid, when used to build a protein, is going to create a protein with a slightly different shape. That different shape protein may work exactly like the native, normal, common protein. It may completely inactivate it. It may make it a little more efficient or may make it less efficient. So again, different version full of genes, but usually they're only looking at a handful of common variations within those genes. There may be a variation at one specific spot. 80% of the population has a cytosine, 20% has an adenine, and they know that that's associated with different functionalities of the finished protein. But many of these companies, again, are not sequencing the whole gene for that protein. So you may have the normal 80% of will have the version at site 23, but you might have variations in your nucleotide sequence giving rise to differences in the amino acid sequence at rarer locations causing you know, a much less common protein, but they're not even assaying that or telling you that. They're only telling you at these common locations, do you have the most common variation or a less common variation? Again, that probably covers the biggest chunk of the range of possibilities, but it doesn't cover everything. Which form of the gene may be useful in terms of telling you whether it's likely to be somewhat more active, highly more active, somewhat less active, much less active than the normal version of that gene, but it's not telling you everything. My other really big point to make up front is that it's nice to know what version, what blueprint you have for which specific gene, but that is not telling you at all whether that gene is actually being made or how much of that gene is being made. What it's telling you is if that gene is made in normal amounts, you will have greater or lesser degree of functioning of that gene. But we know that epigenetics, so whether there's methylation, phosphorylation, other chemicals sitting on the DNA affecting how much of that molecule is being made, this genetic testing tells us nothing about that. So you may have a hyperactive version of a specific protein, so the gene coding for the specific protein. You may have super duper really active one, but if there are epigenetic changes in your DNA, maybe you're not making any of that protein. So it doesn't really matter if you have a super duper active version of the gene, nothing's being made. Or maybe an easier to understand, people vary incredibly in your baseline tolerance of alcohol, how quickly you chew up an ounce of alcohol that's in a beer or a glass of wine. So baseline, the enzymes people have, the different versions of their genes do vary a lot. And again, different people metabolize alcohol at different rates. However, if you give someone who's a slow metabolizer, a medium metabolizer, a rapid metabolizer, make them have a few drinks every day for a month, every day for a year, end of that time, everyone will be more tolerant. Their tolerance for alcohol will have grown up. Epigenetic factors will essentially boost the manufacturing of whatever version. It's not changing your genes, but it's changing how activated that gene is. And essentially it's activating whatever you have to chew up alcohol faster. So that's the big reason that there's a huge limitation on what this can do. So what do the current tests we have out there? And I tried to look at the whole range of genes that they are testing for. And essentially they're in five or six different categories. One is, and this wasn't true in the very beginning, there are now some companies that are testing for genes that are coding for proteins and glycoproteins, so sugar protein complex, that do control absorption, both absorption of the drug from your intestine into your bloodstream. And some of those same chemicals actually also affect how readily the drug moves from the bloodstream into the brain. If your body's dehydrated, your brain's going to be more dehydrated. Water flows pretty quickly from the bloodstream into the brain. Tiny molecules, sugar, sodium, potassium, chloride, those move pretty quickly. But any bigger molecule is blocked from moving from the blood into the brain by what's called the blood-brain barrier. And there are specific proteins, I mean, some actually pump things, some ferry things across, some help move. There's a variety of different chemical ways to move bigger objects 
from the bloodstream into the brain. And again, some of these glycoproteins that we know have different genetic variants are involved in this process. So absorption for drugs is one category that they can test for. You can also test for different versions of certain receptors. The neurotransmitters we like to focus on most, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, again, we've talked before, even though those are the most talked about neurotransmitters, each of them probably represents less than 1% of the neurons in the brain. So these are small numerically systems. They are important. They do ramify, spread all over the brain and control things. Serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine has different families of receptors that bind to the neurochemical molecule. Each family, there are also subsets of it. With genetic testing, we can sometimes see which form of which receptor, but it's a very, very small collection of receptors that we can currently easily identify genetic variations in and look at. And probably reinforce later, even the companies that are pushing these, they'll tell you which version of the, let's say, serotonin 2A receptor you have. They'll note that this is not known to be clinically significant. By far, numerically, it's most of what's tested and focused on are, we can consistently say, metabolic enzymes, but we really should be saying catabolic. So metabolic big molecules are made from tiny ones and how they're broken back down into small ones. Anabolic processes are building up. Catabolic are taking down or breaking down. With these different enzymes, you may have the most common version, or you may have a souped up version that breaks things down more quickly. You may have a less efficient version. Some of these testing systems say, oh, if you have an enzyme that breaks things down slowly, and let's say Ritalin is broken down by this enzyme, you shouldn't use that. That's absolutely just flat out silly, stupid, wrong. Getting back to epigenetics, even if you have that version, whether a lot of it's being made or little of it's being made, but let's just assume it's being made at a standard rate and you have a more active version that's chewing up Ritalin more quickly than usual. That would just suggest you need a bigger dose of Ritalin to get a higher blood level and to get a higher brain level. That does not mean you should never use it. If you have a less active version of a catabolic enzyme that results in a higher blood level and higher brain level, that does not mean you should avoid a specific drug. It means you should be cautious. It means you can be maybe a cheapskate, get a much bigger effect from a smaller dose. But it absolutely does not mean you should not use it. And that's, again, part of why these tests sort of overpromise or I've had dozens of people come in and say, this test said I shouldn't be able to use Ritalin and it works fine for me. Or this test said never go to Stratera. I tried it and it works. So again, all these tests are saying is other things being equal, am I likely to have a higher or lower level of the drug in my blood if I have this kind of enzyme breaking things down? And that does not tell you you should not use the drug. It doesn't tell you you should use the drug. It just tells you where your blood range is more likely to wind up. Some of the other things that our testing can do is tell us about side effects, histocompatibility genes. And there are a few genes there that are associated with some really bad side effects of medications, so particularly some bad skin, Stevens-Johnson and other reactions. So it's important where it can be valuable to identify this person is more likely to have a really bad reaction. But again, it's never a one-to-one -one correlation. It doesn't mean if you have this gene, you're absolutely going to get that bad reaction. It doesn't mean you're going to be absolutely prevented or guarded from it by having it. It just means be much more cautious if you have that. Tiny number of genes that are, that are available for testing in these testing kits that are looking at the synthesis of neurotransmitters. Some are looking at the MTHFR, which is a methylfolate. So methylfolate, folate, one of the B vitamins is converted to methylfolate. Methylfolate is involved in making serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. So if that whole pathway is compromised, then you're going to be impaired in making neurotransmitters. But that doesn't seem to be the primary deficit, at least for most people with ADHD or with most other mental health conditions. Some of the enzymes that metabolize 
neurotransmitters, not just drugs. So COMT, methotransferase is an important enzyme for breaking down particularly dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin as well. So when the presynaptic neuron releases neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft, they diffuse to the receptors, they bind, they diffuse off, they get taken back up by the presynaptic nerve that left them, and COMT is an important enzyme that's sitting there at the synaptic level that can capture and destroy some of our neurotransmitters. So it's part of what maintains or helps regulate neurotransmitter levels. I've had some people who were reassured, you know, they needed really high doses of something like Vyvanse or Adderall, and it was reassuring to them to see Yes, my body chews it up really fast. That didn't give them at some practical level much more information than they already knew experientially. The other thing I would say, particularly with ADD medications, and I would say with the exception maybe of guanfacine, it's not just our stimulants, but if you're going to respond to Stratera, Wellbutrin, any other norepinephrine or dopamine reuptake inhibitor, most individuals know immediately within hour, minutes to hours, whether that dose is going to be effective for their ADD. A test that's going to take days to weeks to send away in order, in addition to costing you potentially a few hundred dollars, as well as the whole issue we haven't talked about, about whether having your DNA in the hands of a corporate entity is something you want or don't want. I can see for antidepressants, if these tests were useful, where it might take weeks and weeks to know whether something is going to help, but with the stimulants and most to the non stimulant ADD medications, you can switch to a third or fourth or fifth agent before you'd have the results of these back. So I'm not convinced that for most people, they're serving much use. Stay healthy, stay happy. 